I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Chris Temple, the executive director and co-founder of Living on One and director and producer of Salam Neighborhood. Other works that he's been involved in include Living on One Dollar, Rosa, These Storms, and the Change Series. And if you can believe it, he's raised over half a million dollars to provide microfinance services around the world for education programs and for communities in which they film. Very powerful voice. We'd like to show you a clip before he comes out. Now it's Syria. ISIS. ISIS. Thousands of Syrians have lost their lives in the conflict. The United Nations reports that more than three million Syrians have now been forced to flee their country. This is the tip of the iceberg in Zaatari. في اللحظة اللي بتخطي فيها الحدود بتصبح لهجة وحياتك في إيدين آخر. Still hard to get your head around living in a refugee camp. District five is going to be your temporary home. شكرا. Why did you decide to leave Syria? <laughs> نظرة العالم غالبا ما بتكون او احنا مثل ما بنشوفها احنا انه للعرب او للمسلمين دائما هم ارهابيين. هل هاي النظرة صحيحة كانت بالنسبة لكم شو رأيتوها وهي موجودة فينا ولا لا؟ هو صح احنا بالنهاية بنعتبر لاجئين يعني سواء بأي بلد ثاني. حتى وهم لاجئين then you just hear just like one fact about one person, and you're like, that is something that I could never even imagine. You know, we're not just Syrians and Americans, but we really are neighbors. And when neighbors are in need, hopefully they can come together and, and help each other. Sweet. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, I'm Chris, and this is my partner in crime here. The hairy, not so good looking one on the right is Zach. He's the co creator of all of these films and, and co founder of our production company. Um, so, Zach and I have been working on these projects for a number of years, and Salam Neighbor specifically, which I want to focus on today and on the Syrian refugee crisis, actually started when we were living on a 1978 school bus, you know, as one does, uh, driving around the country with our first film, Living on One Dollar. We were on tour, showing it to communities around the country. And we actually met this incredible woman who was, she was Palestinian-American um, and the daughter of refugees. Uh, and she started talking to us about a lot of these bigger questions around a refugee's life. You know, how, and this one especially, you know, how do you rebuild after you've lost everything. And at the time, this was about three years ago, and we weren't seeing any of those answers in the news and the coverage of what we are seeing. Uh, it was really just predominantly, as it still is today, focused on violence, on fear, on the same images of war over and over again. So th that was really the impetus for us to actually take a month and go and actually live inside of a refugee camp ourselves, not to simulate the life of a refugee, but just to truly have dialogue, to take the time to listen and understand what, what life is like. So we went to Zathari refugee camp. It's about home to, home to about 85,000 Syrian refugees. Our tent was in District 5, up in that top left corner there. Um, you know, and the first person that we really became close with, and some of you got to see the film, was uh, you know, it was our friend Ismail here. He's our same age. Uh, he was studying to be a French teacher back in Damascus. Uh, and he really was, in so many ways, just like you and me. You know, he was so relatable, so 
so much like us. And, and he showed us, you know, about, showed us photos of, you know, what Syria used to be like, this vibrant, green, beautiful country. He talked to us about, you know, the tourism and, and what Damascus was like and, and spoke with so much pride. And Syria, you know, it used to be a huge tourist country, millions of people coming there, more every year than Argentina. And now you see what these images are. And the real difference between him and us is that he was forced to flee. You know, he really had no option but to flee. And I think for a second, I want you guys to imagine what it would be like to, in an instant, um, be forced to leave everything that you ever known and, and flee your country. And so here's a quick clip of that. Happy birthday to you. Make a wish. Have you done your homework? Adam! Radio or not? Here it comes! Island clashes with British. Live ammunition again. Deserve to get shot. And I stay at home. Air strikes on rebel position. We are going to stay. Tapping! Go! So you now have 10 seconds to decide what you're going to bring. You've got, you're fleeing your home, you've got 10 seconds to decide what it is that you're going to bring and bring with you. Here we go. Uh, they're always... Double forces advanced. Double forces It's not just war that can displace people. You're looking at issues like natural disaster, climate change, a lot of different things that are affecting displacement all around the world, where there are 65 million people displaced now around the world. Um, and obviously, that was a recreation video. But this is our, our little buddy, Rauf. And some of you guys got to see him in the film. But he's an 11-year-old, uh, and he just celebrated his third birthday in Zathri. Um, he's continued to be there in this camp his third year now without access to education, um, and third year uh, being displaced from his home. And, you know, Rauf brought up a lot of big questions around the longevity of this crisis, where oftentimes people think about refugee issues as a short-term problem. It's a short-term thing about humanitarian needs, right? Where if we provide food, shelter, blankets, that's enough. We did our part, right? We helped people get survive, you know, we, we, kept, we kept people alive. Um, but when you think about it, on average, refugees like Rauf are displaced for 17 years living inside of these camps. That's just the global average. So that's an entire childhood. And I think what's so frustrating when you start to think about that is, you know, if you're in these camps with really limited access to education, really limited access to, you know, right to work, you know, you've got an entire generation that's hugely at risk. Um, to spiraling into poverty, or even worse, spiraling towards issues like fundamentalist extremism and others. Um, and so it starts to bring up these bigger questions that I want you guys to think about of, you know, is warehousing someone in a refugee camp for, you know, in a one mile by two mile radius and just providing basic needs, is that enough? Or is education a fundamental human right? Is right to work a fundamental human right? And I think this is a lot of these questions that we should all be considering in any of our work as we go through, and as especially as we think about addressing this crisis. And you realize, too, that you know, in this context, uh, the Syrian context, people have no home to go back to. It's not something like they, they chose to leave, chose to, to make this type of journey. Uh, and this footage I found really, really powerful. I want to show you a short clip of what Aleppo, a major thriving city in Syria, looks like right now. And 
I mean, these are haunting images. I purposely left it without sound just to, it, it's just so, so powerful to see you know, who is going to rebuild this. And I think that that's a fundamental question that we have to consider in this long-term crisis response. Again, if someone's stuck in a camp for 17 years, this crisis isn't ending anytime soon, who's going to go back and rebuild Syria? And I think the, the answer is actually pretty clear. The answer is the people inside of these camps. It's the Syrians themselves are the solution to this crisis. And so how do you unlock their potential? How do you open up more opportunity for Syrians to work, for Syrians to build, and for Syrians to, to be that answer? And the, and the thing is, it doesn't, you know, it, it's helpful whether or not they're rebuilding Syria or if they're in the host countries currently, because then they can actually be a productive you know, boon to that society. They can be filling labor needs. They can be coming in and doing incredible things. And you know, inside of this camp, they built this massive economy. There are over 3,000 businesses operating inside of this refugee camp. It's not just people sitting there waiting for handouts. It's people who are really actively thriving and, and trying to rebuild their lives. Uh, there's even, one of my favorite things, there's even a, a pizza delivery system inside of the camp that the UN has no idea how it operates, no joke, because you know, there, there's no street signs, there's nothing like that, but Syrians have found a way to, yeah, to try to regain a sense of normalcy. And I think, you know, it's again, another example of that strength of the human spirit that so many of you have probably seen across your work that people want to be productive. They want to rebuild their lives. Um, and we are seeing that all over the place. Um, and you, know, you can even see just in a couple of really powerful images of this is when the camp first started, and then it started just building out more and more, building out even more, and just you know, it's resembling more and more of a city by the end of it. Uh, and, and why do we consider refugee camps camps instead of considering them cities? Uh, and the real answer lies in the fact that it's very, very stressful on these host countries right now. There's a couple countries in particular that are hosting 90% of Syrian refugees. It's Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, and Egypt. Um, and those countries are taking huge, huge strain from the numbers that are coming in. Just to put a little perspective on it, uh, the amount that Jordan has taken in, for example, would be the equivalent of the U.S. taking half of Mexico in four years. So thinking about what that does to the labor market, to, to employment, to the, you know, even social services, crowded hospitals, crowded schools. And so the, if this burden, though, is actually more equally distributed between countries, it doesn't have to be a burden. Because as we've seen, Syrians can be the solution. They can productively add to these countries, but not when it's at this scale that it currently is. And if we're not willing to take refugees into our own countries, we better, better be willing to put money and invest in the long-term development of these host countries, a country like Jordan, who's actually an incredible ally of the US as well, and a country that you know, if we can continue to keep stable and continue to put in development funding, infrastructure projects, job creation, it's not only helping Syrians, but it's also helping the refugees themselves, creating this amazing win-win scenario, which is what the ideal situation is to respond to this crisis. Um, so since we left that camp, um, as you might imagine, there was a lot of frustration and a lot of guilt as we were leaving you know, we got to parachute in for five weeks and then leave this refugee camp. Uh, and our friends, you know, Rauf and Ismail are still there inside the camp. They're still, you know, as we speak right now. So we were really trying to figure out what to, what to do with that guilt and that frustration and channeled it actually, thankfully, into the creation of the film that some of you guys got to see, uh, a feature documentary, 75 Minutes, called Salam Neighbor. Uh, and the film, um, you know, we had about 250 hours of footage uh, and created about 50 rough cuts of the film over the last, uh, over the last two years uh, to finish that and create the film. So thankfully, we had this outlet and this channel to put all of our energy into. Because honestly, I think the best cure for guilt is action, uh, as many of you probably know. Um, but for us, again, once the cr we created the film, that was just the first step. Uh, and thankfully for us, it's been kind of about a year now since we first started showing people the film, first started getting it out, uh, and it's been about what impact can we actually create. You can create a film, but if it doesn't actually drive any change, 
what's the point? If it doesn't inspire action, what's the purpose of this film? So we've taken the film on tour, actually brought around a, a nice refugee uh, tent with us to a lot of universities, schools, um, conferences, places like this as well to get to share this message. I've done 286 events since January. Um, uh, which has been an insane whirlwind. And actually, just on Monday, a lot of this momentum of, with the film, the distribution, uh, culminated where it released uh, globally on Netflix on, uh, on Monday uh, in 21 different languages around the world. So thank you. So that's just kind of like the, the filmmaker's dream to get it out there you know, in that sort of way. But, but some of the things along the, you know, along the way that we're trying to inspire is, above all, number one is to try to change the conversation around refugees, to change the way that we view a refugee. And number two is really looking at uh, asking people to come in and take action. So on our website right now, people can come and fundraise and volunteer for uh, a couple incredible organizations, the IRC, Save the Children, and UNHCR, who's working in the camp. Uh, and you can actually directly donate to programs that are affecting the main characters in the film, and 100% of any of that money goes directly to those programs. And we've been so thankful to raise about $145,000 already, even before the Netflix release, for, for those programs, which is just, again, seeing at least some of that financial return for the organizations doing incredible work has been testament to you guys, to people being willing to get engaged and, and involved. Um, and second, on the volunteering, people are coming in and volunteering to welcome people, uh, new resettled refugees here in our own communities, to come in and be a part of uh, of that moment when someone arrives off a plane into a new country, into a new community, and how are we going to welcome them? Uh, and I think that's a huge element. And then the third, which has been really fun, is actually we have a petition going right now and for the, since January uh, with Global Citizen, a partner of ours, uh, to uh, earmark money for education in emergencies, to make sure that things like that aren't being lost when you're looking at these short-term humanitarian issues. So we've had about 250,000 people sign this petition since January. Um, and then just last, at the end of May, uh, we got to go to the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul. And uh, instead of us presenting these petitions to world leaders, uh, Rauf did. Uh, and I wanted to show you that. <laughs> هناك 150,000 توقيع من عدة عرائض كافة أنحاء العالم الذي تدعو جميع قائدة العالم للدعم المعنوي والمادي اليوم في إسطنبول نحن نترجاكم أريد أن أصبح طبيبا نرجوكم أن تساعدوا أطفال الغد ساعدوا جيرانكم Thank you And on the spot And on the spot, uh, world leaders pledge $90 million to that fund, thanks to the work of you guys and Raul. <laughs> and so these actions, these little things, are having a huge impact. But I wanted to leave you with one just overarching thing that I think is the key to dealing with this crisis and dealing with a very toxic environment that we're hearing around Syrian refugees right now. And the key is dialogue. And that's what this film to us was always about, was about going in and taking the time to speak with somebody who's different than you, speak with somebody from a different religion, a different background, speak with a refugee and hear their voices, have these dialogues instead of monologues, which is happening back and forth in, around this crisis right now. And we, why it's so important is, you know, we actually got the chance to go back to the camp uh, very recently um, in December. And we showed Rauf and Ismail and everybody the film before we showed it to all of you guys. To, it's you know, such a sensitive and intimate film. We wanted to make sure they were OK with it before we showed it to others. Um, and yeah, Ismail, was, uh, his, his quote about it was what, uh, I, w I was so surprised it was any good. Um, <laughs> so that was his reaction. It had the ye of little faith. Um, but you know, we, at that moment, though, you know, we were speaking with him about um, you know, about the film and what we're doing with it. And he asked us, you know, why he was quoting people in the, in the political sphere saying, you know, why did Ben Carson call Syrian refugees rabid dogs? Why were, why is there this, this discussion of, of banning Muslims from the United States? I don't understand it. And he was asking in a very genuine way, just really trying to understand what the connection was between him fleeing a war and him fleeing a group like Daesh and ISIS 
and then why he somehow got lumped in with this group, with a small group of horrible individuals who have nothing to do with the refugee population. Um, and I think what it just reminded us of was this is such a smaller, more interconnected world that there is no way we can take a path of isolationism. There's no way we can give in to that fear. The only approach to making this world a more secure place is having that dialogue, is listening, is trying to promote that. And if we give in to the fear, then that's what a group like Daesh or ISIS wants. And I, and I hope that you guys will consider as, you know, as we move forward from here, you know, the, the Syrians and the rest of the world is listening to this dialogue, and I think history will judge all of us on the decisions that we make. So thank you guys so much, and I'm gonna take a couple questions. Yeah. You know, Chris, I feel as a journalist that we, as journalists and the media, have failed people on the issue of Syria. Mm -hmm. I just find it very difficult sometimes to get serious stories done uh, that viewers, we believe, are sort of desensitized because it's the same images that we end up showing over and over again. Yeah. Of all the humanitarian issues you could have focused on, why Syrian refugees? So, I mean, we started this project about three years ago. Uh, so before, you know, the Paris attacks, before Eamon, the small boy, washed up on the shore, it wasn't the media topic. and and. You know, with the time when you're looking at, I was actually an economics major in college. I've never taken a film class in my life still. Uh, we learned from YouTube. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, you know, we were, when you looked at the numbers, there's no way this crisis wasn't gonna hit the boiling point that it is now. And it really truly is the most pressing humanitarian crisis that the world has seen you know, it, since World War II. I mean, it's a, it's a tragically horrible situation, uh, this even global migration. So when we, when we were looking at an area to, to, to focus on, it really, it just felt so right. And we, we didn't know what the film would become, we didn't know what the project would become. Actually, its initial uh, idea was only supposed to be 20 minutes mm -hmm. and done in six months, and now here I am three years later. So wow. these projects have a way of, in, of inspiring and enveloping you. It's a, it's a very powerful voice and a powerful light that you've shined. You talked earlier um, that education should be a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. I worry so much about there's a whole generation of younger kids who are not being educated because they're in these camps. Mm -hmm. And I worry about what that does it, just on a selfish, self-centered focus to terrorism. Yeah. I mean, a large, I think it's something like two-thirds of the population in the Middle East are under the age of 28. Mm -hmm. What have you seen, do you think that that's gonna change? that that lack of education for this whole community who have become nomads in some sense. I mean, whether or not that changes is up to us. It's up to what the international community is gonna respond in this moment, and then it's about the refugee population following through on it, which I do believe we, they've seen, we're seeing the semblance of, of that already starting to happen. But you know, when you look at yeah, the refugees in this camp, the, the really, the formula for what creates fundamentalism, what creates these types of attacks, it's not about religion, it's about poverty, it's about ignorance, it's breeding, it's coming out of these, these destitute situations that we can actually play a factor in helping to, com to combat. And not through always missiles and more boots on the ground, but through these actual programs that you see people running, but if you, if you take a Syrian population that is already educated, has so much potential. There's doctors, there's lawyers, there's kids who are educated who now are sitting in refugee camps. We're hitting the fifth, sixth year now. If we wait any longer, then they, they will spiral towards poverty and towards that ignorance. But if we can still, there's still this chance mm -hmm. to keep, uh, you know, to kind of keep that population afloat. I often wonder the way that people look at George W. Bush's legacy and with the situation in Iraq, will Syria be President Obama's equivalent? That's a big question, and he just did, uh, you know, he's, he's spoken a lot on this issue from the political intervention standpoint. Um, and the U.S. has obviously pledged a lot of money to the humanitarian issue. Uh, but, you know, beyond, I think it will sh overshadow a lot of what he's talking about, but it's a very, very complicated situation when you look at a political solution inside of Syria. I mean, you've got so many levels from 
you know, on the basic level, you have you know rebel groups and and Assad going at it and, and fighting very disparate rebel groups. One so level above that. So, if not political, that. how do you see any change in that area? I mean, you have to continue to push for political solutions. But the problem is, you cannot wait for a political solution. Is what I think is key. Mm -hmm. So it's really about uh, about the combination. But without a political solution, this war will not end, mm -hmm. and that is that is very true. Are you still continuing your relationship with people from the camp? Do you keep in touch? Yeah, so you know what's been amazing is they're all on WhatsApp, they're all on Facebook. <laughs> uh, so you know we continually actually keep in touch all the time, um, and that's how we're able to send videos back and forth and conversation. You can use Google Translate to have full conversations. Wow. So you know again, that's just another example to us of how much smaller of a world it truly is right now. Mm -hmm. And there's been a couple of interesting updates where um, you know through conversation with Ismail and figuring out more with him, uh, we've actually uh, just been able to raise the money for his resettlement to Canada. Mm -hmm. So he's actually now being resettled to Canada with his entire family. Um, and Canada has an amazing Patience. private sponsorship system where if you raise the money personally, $35,000, um, uh, as a Canadian citizen, you, the Canadian government will accept a resettled family. And what you're doing is coming in and just kind of helping to pay for some of that first startup cost. But what an amazing program to empower your own citizens and help uh, you know, people around the world. A lot of people point to Trudeau, the prime minister there, of saying what he's done for Syrian refugees is pretty remarkable. I have a man crush, totally. I do you, I can see why. <laughs> I can see why. Our Lara Logan did a, a yeah. profile of him for 60 minutes and it was really cool to watch. Yeah. Um, the, one of the questions here is the risk of assault against women and especially kids in camps has been in the news. Did this come up in your time there? Oh my, I mean, the protection issues for women, um, especially in these camps, and, and even more actually in the urban areas, is a huge issue, and, and the IRC and others are doing a lot of work to help on the protection side, but you have, I mean, one in four women, Syrian women in this crisis are head of, are you single, you know, mothers in this crisis, single head of household, and so you've got a lot of vulnerability, and they've got very low, uh, very low income, very little access to work or places to live. So you do see, especially in these types of crisis, more vulnerability for the children and for, for women populations. Have you noticed shifting attitudes towards Syrian refugees in America since you made the film? You know, it's hard to tell. We've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, every screening, uh, and you guys will as well probably get a, uh, a survey understanding what your thoughts were mm -hmm. kind of before and after the film, and has there been a shift as a result of this film in any capacity. Um, but more broadly, even beyond how this film might be affecting people, sadly, I think the dialogue around Syrian refugees has continued to go spiral towards a more negative dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that is through a very charged political conversation, um, and I think a lot of fear. And, and what I would like to say is that I understand there's a security risk that's yeah. being presented by a group like Daesh or ISIS, but the, the key question is how do we combat a group like that? And there are two very different approaches that you can take. And one is that fear-based one I was talking about, and the second is one that's really based on dialogue, that's based on not an isolationist approach, but about engagement and about uh, humanitarian intervention. If you could sort of uh, pick the future, mm -hmm. and if there were three things you would like to see that could transform the situation in Syria, mm -hmm. what would they be? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I mean, three things that could transform. I mean, it, you really, really hope for um, a political solution, yeah. uh, and I think that there's there's varying degrees of what countries could do there, uh, from no-fly zones to more political pressure being put on uh, regional players uh, to to stop their support of, of local governments like like the Assad regime. Um, two, definitely on the humanitarian interventions, uh, there needs to be a significant increase in money going to this crisis. The UNHCR last year was only reached 51% uh, of its budget that it was asking for to respond to this crisis. So in those moments, of course, people are going to cut the important things like education, like job creation, microfinance programs, things like that that could really help. Uh, and then the third is on resettlement. I mean, I think each of us plays an amazing, has an amazing opportunity to say, no, we're willing to welcome refugees into our own communities. Um, and these are people who are incredibly well vetted. We actually had a screening last night with the Department of Homeland Security and walked through all of the different layers that, that over a two-year process that Syrian refugees have to go through 
to be welcomed into the United States. It is not the population that we need to fear. Um, and, and so I think that that element does a lot, too, to showing the international community that the United States is welcoming, that what makes us stronger is the diversity of the people here. And, and I hope that all of us will continue to keep that in our minds as we, as we leave here today. Good point. Before I let you go, we're actually way out of time. Just a quick answer. How do you, if someone's passionate about an issue and wants to do what you did and make a film, how do they go about getting financed? Oof. It's impossible. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it, getting finance is a really difficult process, especially early. Yeah. Um, now it would be people would th maybe help us finance this film once it's created, but that first step is really important. And we actually were lucky to work with two uh, Arab co-producers on this film, which was amazing. Uh, kind of what you see behind camera is actually what you see on camera is actually, you know, Arabs and Americans coming together to try to create something. And so they're willing to help us in that first moment to come in and, and finance this. And, and really the private donors are the absolute key to that first, first level. And then once you've got something, something to show, even a small teaser, some footage, then you can start to go after grants and other places. But I'm happy to provide any insight more specifically to people afterwards and we can chat about it. Great. Chris Temple, this is a, a powerful light and an issue that just we don't get enough media attention on. It is uh, Salam Neighbor on Netflix. I look forward to watching it again. Thanks so much. Thank you, yeah. Chris. That's great. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Thank yeah. you very much. Really good. Yeah.